Good morning, Flag Church, and welcome to the 1130 service. Good decision, by the way. You missed the blizzard in the 830 service that we had. <laughs> Man, we were slipping and sliding all over the place. I almost had to call in the National Guard. The, uh, but welcome. We're glad you're here. If you're joining us online, I'm glad you're here. I literally got an email as Sarah was giving those announcements a few moments ago that we've already hit 80% of our allotted hours on our Ustream account, which is what we stream on which means normally we have 100 hours a month and it takes us, and we hardly ever pass at 100 hours, but the past three months our online has grown tremendously. And so if you're joining us online, we're glad that you're here. Very glad that you're here. We're in week two of this series, 50 Shades of Deeper Grace. Deeper Grace. If the world's going to go darker, we'll just go deeper with it. And we're talking about love, sex, and dating because it's an area of our lives that has tremendous impact, long-lasting influence and power in our lives. Much of the teaching the church has given over the years has been inadequate. Sometimes maybe all you heard was the word don't, and much, much of what we're going to get from the world is perverted. I had somebody text me yesterday saying, hey, will tomorrow's message be okay for a 12-year-old girl? And I was thinking, I go, yeah, I do. There may be one in there uh, coming up, and it might be next week. I'm not sure. We're still figuring out what next Sunday's message will be that uh, might, might be a little, little uncomfortable for the 12-year-old girl, but she can hear it here or she can hear it in the playground. <laughs> Or hear it in the lunchroom, one of the two. She's going to hear it somewhere. So I, w I would be comfortable with my 12-year-old hearing it. Because that only gets your attention for 15 minutes, but it doesn't bear any fruit. But we want to be accurate and we want to be useful. That this area of uh, love, sex, and dating in our lives usually is a temptation. Even after you're married, love, sex, and dating can be a temptation. What if it's, instead of a temptation, it's a foundation? What is, the foundation? What, what is the foundation for men to realize we don't have to go fake and virtual online, but we can go ahead and do real life with real women in our lives? What if it's a foundation for women to realize that when they see the fake thing on the magazine cover, they realize I don't have to compare myself to that or value myself based on my, what, what other people think I am uh, physically for my, attra my attractive and my appearance? If we can challenge adult singles to go ahead and have a foundation of I'm more worried about what I'm becoming than who's coming into my life. And if we can challenge teens to actually look forward to marriage instead of thinking that it's the last ditch thing or the last thing you want to do or no fun now because it's all downhill after that. No wonder they think that view of marriage if, if what they see is just, just brokenness and they don't see how powerful and strong it can be. So the idea of Fifty Shades of Deeper Grace is just that, grace. So grace for the divorced in the room grace grace for the broken grace for the one night stand mistake or the eight year relationship mistake that you wish only would have lasted one year grace for the abused if you've been abused god's grace to you god's grace to the abuser as well and that's where we get a little uncomfortable right it's okay for, for God to be kind and give grace and help the person who's been abused, but the abuser, they should get. It's not fair for God to give his grace to the abuser, is it? It's not fair. It's not, it's not fair, but grace isn't fair. It's a different level. It's way above fair. And I'm sure you're similar to me. The last thing I want when I see God is fair. <laughs> I don't want fair. I don't need fair. I want nothing to do with fair. I don't need fair play. I need grace. Grace, that's what he gives. That's what he offers. So last week we talked about the power of grace and truth. We went to the story in John chapter 8 where a woman was caught in adultery. The religious leaders brought her, made her stand before everybody. And Jesus said, whoever's without the sin can throw the first stone. You know, whoever wants to throw the first punch, as long as you're sinless, go ahead. And then no one did. They all left. And he said, hey, who's condemning you? And uh, she responded and said, no one, sir. And you can check this message out on the podcast. It's online on the website, all that kind of stuff. The... Uh, and then uh, she said, and he, Jesus said back to her, then neither do I condemn you. He declared it. Neither do I condemn you. He declared it. Now, go now and leave, leave your life of sin. So Jesus didn't water down the truth. Sexual sin was still sexual sin. And he didn't put a condition on grace. So he's 100% grace and 100% truth. Not a balance, not a mix, both. And that gets messy sometimes. Because he is what grace and truth look like. If you're following along in your notes, you can jot this one down. If you're online, you can see the notes on the side there. Jesus is what grace and truth look like in a graceless world. That's our world. It's pretty graceless. And it's a world that's turned its back on truth. The scripture is pretty plain that Jesus was full of grace and truth. Not just a little bit of both or a balance, but he's full of both. Full of both. 
And we gave you three safe steps last week to take. Three safe steps to believe Jesus, receive grace, and leave sin. Third one is a hard one, right? Believe Jesus. Sure, I can do that. All right, all right. He's good. Who, who hates Jesus, man? Come on. He's like a puppy dog. He's awesome. Receive grace. Sure, I want grace. Leave sin. Ooh, now I have to do something. Yeah, you have to do something. And leaving could very well be the evidence of your believing and your receiving. I'm not trying to be cute with it. I'm trying to be memorable with it so it'll stick with you. If you haven't left it, have you really believed them and have you really received the grace to give you the power to leave that sin? And we're talking about the sexual sin and we're talking, we made the pl- made plain last week, every one of us in the room are guilty of some form of sexual sin, lust, porn, whatever you want to call it. So we're, we, all, we all got, maybe if we're pointing our finger at someone, we're just the biggest hypocrite in the world, man. So we're all broken in this area, but it still has tremendous impact and influence on us. So we're talking about the idea that our culture has about if we can find the right person in our life and everything will be just fine. And we want to have great relationships. This church wants you to have great relationships. Who doesn't, man? So this message is for those of you who are married or you're thinking about getting married or you've given up on marriage. We want to tell you don't give up on, on the idea of being married. Uh, we want to give this message for anyone who is dating, anyone who is married, anyone who's in a permanent one-on-one relationship, anyone who's uh, cohabiting. Do you realize that over 60% of our first-time guests are not married people? You know, we did the whole, the whole survey thing back in January or February. It's well over 60% of people that are the first time here, they're not married people. So if you think everyone here is just all tied to a family, there are tons of single adults here, more than you can fathom. And not just the college age, not just the college. But for us to get a good idea to grasp on what we're supposed to do, this message is probably for everybody except one kind of person, the recreational dater. The person who is, I'm just playing the field. I'm doing what I want, when I want, with who I want. I got no desire to commit at all. I'm just playing. And some people would call them a player. Yeah, this message wouldn't be for them. This message actually should help you spot them <laughs> and avoid them if possible. When we realize that all of life is connected, we don't get to compartmentalize. Men, pay attention. It's been told that women are spaghetti. You can't just pull one part out, but men are waffles because you can cut them up and compartmentalize. You can't compartmentalize life. Your past will be present in your future. It doesn't mean we can't be free from our past, and it doesn't mean we can't have victory over it, but it's still going to be present. If you had a one-night stand when you were 16 and you got a kid, you're still going to have that woman in your life when you go to that kid's high school graduation. Your past will be present in your future. So if we can get some inspiration today to realize that if I can change my present right now, and we're going to talk about things that you can change, you're directing your preferred future. And we all have a preferred future in mind. And for many of us, not everyone, it's a different message for a different day, but there's nothing wrong with being single. Your Savior was a 33-year-old single Jewish man who had a Jewish mama that would have liked grandbabies. It's okay to be single. One is a whole number. But for those of us that are considering marriage or look in that direction, we look at that and we go, we look at people who we know who are married or we look at people who used to be married. We look at our parents' marriage. And we sit there and we go, man, maybe I don't want to be married. They got problems, man. The people I know that used to be married had problems. The people that I know right now got problems. Uh, my parents had problems. Married, mar- many, maybe that married people just have lots of problems. And the single people I know, man, they get to do what they want, when they want, how they want. Maybe I'll just stay single. Married people don't have married problems. Married people have people problems. Because there's two people in that marriage. That single guy took his problems and his, let's say, lazy work ethic, and he brought it to this marriage. And she took this problem, let's say it's over-control issues, and she brought it to the marriage. And they thought because they liked each other and they had chemistry and sexual passion that they would override each other's faults, and they don't. And so he brought his problem to the marriage, and now he's not too happy, so he's pretty sure he has married people problems. No, he has immature guy problems that he brought to the marriage. She's pretty sure that because she's in the marriage that maybe he, she has married people problems. No, two people who had problems brought them to the marriage because they didn't deal with them before they got married. And that will always happen that way. But the difficulty is if we think of the married problem, then we think if we get out of the marriage, we get rid of the problem. Let's get a refund, get an upgrade. That's what we do. It doesn't seem to be working real well. It leaves people more broken than they were before. And maybe we think that because we bought into a a lie, a myth, that says if you find the right person, everything will be awesome. 
Our music talks about it. Our stories talk about it. Our culture celebrates this idea. It's, it's a fairy tale. It's a fairy tale. If I marry the right person, I don't have to work on my faults, and everything will be fine. If I just find the right person, cue Disney music right now, right? Uh huh. <laughs> Beautiful music. It's a small world after all comes on in. Problem is, if you're thinking you don't take care of your faults when you come into the marriage because you found the right person, so do they. And now you have two people that expect everyone else, the other person, to fix their problems. See, there's Joe and Susie. And Joe and Susie were convinced they found the right person. Joe was really convinced that Susie's the right person and is going to fix everything that's wrong with Joe. <laughs> and Susie's convinced that, that Joe's the right person totally. It's going to be awesome because they know each other. Why, why do they feel that way? Why does Joe think that Susie's the perfect person for her, for him? And why does Susie think that, man, if Joe will just commit to me, we'll be awesome together? Why? Because they got chemistry. Because they are physically and sexually attracted to each other. Because they are head over heels in love. They have gotten attracted to each other. Things are moving forward at a torrid pace. They are following their heart, and they have fallen in love. And doesn't society love that? Hollywood loves that. Put a little bit of comedy in there. Put a goofy brother-in-law in there. And boom, you got a $50 million movie. Rom-com, here we go. And all the guys are going, yep, another rom-com to go to. Awesome. <laughs> rom-com, romantic comedy, for those of you still trying to catch that. So what are Joe and Susie doing? Back to the, the message. They're following their heart, and they've fallen in love. What does the Bible tell you to do? Guard your heart. Grow in love. Not put your heart in a casket so nobody can touch it, but guard it. Not put it out on the dance floor if you're in your 20s or in your all skate if you're still in middle school <laughs> and put it out on the dance floor so that anybody and everybody has access to it. Guard it. And not fall in love like it's a pit you get stuck in, but grow in it because of decisions, commitment, and wisdom. Joe and Susie got a lot of chemistry, but they don't have a lot of anything else. So after two or three years, the chemistry that was sizzle is now fizzle. And so how can they get the sizzle back? Let's have a kid. And so they bring the kid in to get the chemistry back. The kid don't bring the chemistry. The kid brings the chaos. Can I get an amen in the house? Amen. The kid brings the chaos. And the kid lowers the amount of spendable income for date night. And he lowers the amount of energy to do anything after date night. So therefore, there's less fizzle. No sizzle. And they start looking at each other and they go, I'm not very happy. Maybe I married the wrong person. Maybe that's the problem. Maybe that's why I'm not satisfied. I'm not content. I'm not happy. Maybe I married. Maybe that's why things aren't going. They might be the right person. They always smile at me. They're always nice to me at the office. Maybe, 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 maybe they're the right person. And if we're not careful, instead of a 40-year relationship, we have 10 four-year relationships, and we get more and more broken and bankrupt after each one, literally and figuratively. That doesn't have to be your future. It does not have to be. You have a lot of choice in the matter because there's hope regardless of your past. Regardless of your sexual past, there's hope. This doesn't have to be your future. So let me give you an example. Let's say Jack is playing the field. And Jack can be your uh, eighth grade boyfriend. Jack could be the uh, uh, single guy in college at 22. Or Jack could be the divorced guy with a lot of money in his 40s. But Jack is playing the field. He is dating whoever he wants, doing whatever he wants. No commitment. No st everything's no strings attached. Jack has got a tind his Tinder profile going just fine. And he's loving everything that's going on. He's getting everything that he wants. He has to give nothing he doesn't want. But like nearly every one of us, he still desires a permanent connection. Just hasn't found it yet. That's Jack. And then Jack runs across Jill. And Jill's the complete package. She's Mrs. Wright. She's extremely attractive. She's kept her physical fitness. She's financially stable. She has a degree that is paid off. But she's also godly. And doesn't just talk church. She actually really even actually serves in the church that she goes to. And she has comfortably and confidently and securely turned away every one of Jack's sexual advances, which actually has turned Jack on even more and gotten Jack even more interested in Jill over here because Jill's finally got a, she finally ran across a woman who's got a backbone and will stand up and do what's right, which has got Jack even more interested in Jill. 
And Jack's like, you know what? This chick over here, she is so awesome and amazing. I think I would get rid of my loose morals, my loose commitment, and I think I'd even resurrect my dead faith for a woman like that. Jack is looking for a woman like that. Is someone living like Jill? Looking for somebody like Jack. Yeah. So which one are you living like? We all want the Jill kind of person to be interested in us. But we won't have that person interested in us if we're living like Jack. So your takeaway statement today, and it's not original with me, it's just really good. Are you the person, the person you're looking for, is looking for? Are you the person, the person you're looking for, is looking for? And if you're married, you, you can definitely tweak that. Are you the spouse your spouse is looking for? And your spouse shouldn't have to be looking for anybody else. Because you're going to try and be the spouse that your spouse is needing. Singles, can you say, I'm going to become a person that a person like that is looking for? You see, there's a corollary to this. What your life is becoming trumps who is coming into your life. What your life is becoming trumps who is coming into your life. And it's obvious when you take a look at it, you can control what you're becoming. You have no control who is coming into your life. And the Bible has just about no help for you whatsoever on how to control who comes into your life. Who's going who's gonna to sit across from me in class? Who's going to be the new coworker that comes in and you're going, whoa, they're cute, that's awesome. You have no, no control over that. The Bible doesn't tell you where to sit in class to go ahead and get put to the right person. The Bible doesn't tell you what place to go to, what singles group to get connected to to find somebody. But the Bible has a lot to say about how to become how to become the person that that person you'd like to have interested in you would be interested in you. Bible has a lot to say about that. A lot to say about that. And then the focus moves from hunting and, and chasing and trying to find someone to becoming. Because love isn't found. I found love. Love isn't found. I fell in love. Love isn't fallen into. Love is formed. And it flourishes from what we become. So I want to take you to an extremely I want to take you a passage of scripture that's extremely sappy. It's cheesy almost. And you hear it at weddings and you go, ah, oh. well, at least the ladies do. The guys go, yeah, I heard this. Come on, when are we eating? When are we eating? Come on, let's go. When are we eating? But you got to remember who wrote it. An old guy who'd been beaten up a lot and seen a lot of hate. And he used to be a, a man of a lot of hate. His name was Paul the apostle. And so he definitely is looking at love a little bit different than two 20-year-olds getting married in a fancy church building. He wrote this, love is patient. What your life is becoming, you can become patient, trumps who's coming into your life. Love is patient. It's not pushy. This idea of the right person myth is kind of crazy. You, you got someone that says, uh, man, I'm kind of impatient, but uh, if I meet the right person, I won't need to be patient anymore because if I meet the right person, they'll never push my buttons. Isn't that awesome? Oh, I'm just so in love. I'm never going to get angry again. You know, I'm just a spontaneous person, and he's so structured. We're perfect for each other. Yeah. Opposites attract until they attack common and normal what's mature will you submit to each other or will you try and get each other to submit that should have been a fill in the blank wow that was pretty good good preaching mark if we think the right person is going to fix everything that's wrong with us why do we think god created them you see there's not one of you that God created you, and if you were to say, God, why did you make me? He's going to say, oh, I made you because there's someone else you're going to meet that is not willing to work on their character or their holiness, and I just created you to be a perfect fix for them. Your sole purpose is just to make up for their lack of effort. Doesn't make any sense, does it? Not at all. God's created no one to be the quick fix for someone else's lack of character or lack of holiness. 
Love is patient. Do we want love? Sure we do we want love. Love's got a lot to do with it. It's not a second-hand emotion. But the Beatles were wrong. It's not all you need. You need patience. And you know what? You can be more patient. Do you want to be? No, of course not. <laughs> but you can be more patient. You can't control who's coming into your life, but you can be more patient. Let's go to the next one. Love is patient. Love is kind. The word I put in there is considerate. Because the word kind sounds wimpy. Hey, what is he like? Oh, he's kind. No, no, no man puts that on his resume. Man, I play defensive end and I'm kind. Nobody says that. But the idea of kind means consider. It means I'm going to put someone else before me. That's sacrificial. That's selfless. How high could the levels of your past relationships have been, even the ones that have fallen apart, could have been risen if the person was considerate? And you can become more considerate. You totally can. Now, whether you want to or not is a different story. Whether you will is a different story, but you can. You have total control over being considerate. Way beyond just saying, oh, no, you first, you first, you first. But when you have a disagreement with a friendship and a relationship, and you want to say, you first, without a bad attitude, now we're being considerate. Next, talking about secure and confident. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy. Man, is that one of the ugliest human emotions you can find, envy. But have security and confidence in themselves. See, if you're insecure, you can't let anybody else win. Everyone else is competition. We see ladies do that all the other time in sizing up other ladies, and men do it with men. They size up each other's biceps. They size up each other's trucks. They size up each other's wallets. They size up each other's wives. They si comparison. There's no win. There's no win in comparison. I heard this just at the Stronger Men's Conference. It was my favorite takeaway from the conference. Now can I remember it? Contentment leaves when comparison starts. Do you like contentment? I love contentment. It leaves as soon as comparison starts. You can be secure and confident. And you can decide that. Adult singles, you can decide. How many times, have you, adult singles, have you avoided people that were insecure? Have you have avoided people that were envious and filled with envy? That is never attractive to any of us. And you know what happens if you will become patient, if you'll become kind, if you will go ahead and be more secure and confident, you'll become the person you're looking for, is looking for. You'll become that. Oh, by the way, you'll also be more loving, which looks good on anybody's resume. Next, humble and honorable. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy. It does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking. See, love's not going to dishonor somebody else. Love is not going to create a regret for somebody else, a financial regret for somebody else. Love isn't going to do that. Love's not going to create a relational regret. Love isn't going to make a sexual regret. Love isn't going to behave in a way that is disgraceful, dishonorable, or indecent. At some point in your life, you're going to find someone, and you're going to want to bring them to people that you respect. It could be you're bringing them home to mom and dad, or, and please no giggles, this is legitimately serious, it could be you're bringing them to your son and daughter because you're in a second stage of life right now, and you're looking again to have a permanent relationship for whatever reason, a good reason or a bad reason that it happened. But when things break, it's not good. So now you're sitting there going, crud, dating again. Ugh, this is just like high school. Ugh. But then you're like, I need someone else. I need a vetting process. I've met this person. I think they're okay. I need to know what my parents think. I need to know what my siblings think, maybe. Maybe not that one brother you don't like, but I need to know, just kidding. I need to know what, what my kids think. I need to get some other input here. And you want them to be able to look at that person and, and say, man, they should be on a magazine cover. No, you really don't, do you? Because that really doesn't matter. You want them to be able to say, I think they got character and integrity. I don't think they're going to create regrets for you. That's actually what I put on reference forms. If you ask me to fill out a reference letter for you, I'll write it, yes, blah, 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 they attend our church for X number of years, they serve in this area of ministry. I believe that if you would add them to your organization, they would not create a regret for you. You'd be pleased to have them on your team. You want that to be said about the person you're interested in. How desirable is a humble and honest, honorable, a humble and honorable person to you? How desirable is that for you to work for someone like that? To be married to someone like that? Maybe to have someone like that work for you? Now, the crazy part, I love this, the last part of Paul's definition of love, it is not self-seeking. Isn't the whole concept of American dating self-seeking? Isn't that the whole concept of bachelor, the bachelor in programs like that? 
It's like, man, this is what I want. I want this, 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 I want this. Man, you have all six of those attributes. I think God made you for me. Wow, doesn't that make you feel valuable? <laughs> oh, really? There's six things you want, and I'm all six of those things. <gasps> I'm so honored. No, I would feel so used. That's how I feel. Love is not self-seeking. You get a self-seeking person over here and a self-seeking person over here, and they meet each other. <laughs> they're going to suck all the life out of that relationship until there's nothing left. And then they'll be self-seeking, miserable people. When a relationship is about what you get and not what you give, that's not love. And it will fail. So what do we got so far? Patient, kind, not boastful, humble, oh, honorable. It sounds like a pretty boring date, doesn't it? Can you imagine Saturday morning talking to your friends? Hey, what did you guys do last night? Oh, we were, we were kind to each other. Yeah, we were honorable. Yeah, we were, we were patient. We were patient. I didn't see anything on Instagram from what you did last night. No, no, nothing photo worthy. No, it was, it was pretty, uh, pretty uh, boring. So let me ask you, think back to your family of origin. What would have happened differently in your family if your mom and dad had just been, just been patient with each other? Just patient. Hopefully they'd get connected to Christ and go to church. What if they were just patient? What if your dad had just been considerate instead of critical? Would that have made a difference? What if, what if your mom would have been kind instead of cruel? Could that have made a difference in, in you, in your perspective about marriage? Could it have made a difference to them? Because the issue wasn't chemistry. The issue wasn't whether their bodies were functioning properly in the bedroom, whether they were enjoying each other's bodies. The issue was character, integrity, and selflessness. Which is exactly what you were hoping to see. And when you see that, it gives you great confidence with you're the child. It also gives you a model to look for. Because great relationships for you can't be about you. And you want great relationships for you. We want great relationships for you. Which is why we're giving you the truth, and the hard truth is it can't be about you then. Because it's pretty obvious, none of this stuff is natural. I mean, anyone wanted to walk up and tell us, hey, I'm naturally patient and kind. I'm naturally not envious. We'll just call you a liar to your face, man. We'll even Facebook Live it. Look, a liar right there. Because <laughs> none of us are that. So does that mean that happily married people are faking it? That they're a bunch of hypocrites? Well, some days. <laughs> some days. My wife and I have been healthily married for just short of 28 years at the end of July. And we uh, love each other 330 days a year. And we put up with each other about 35 days a year. Because some days we're not very lovable. But that's because we've decided we're going to be people that prioritize the other person. Even when that's difficult. And now we've got something that money can't touch. I mean, come on, if you, I'm not a gambling person, but if, if, I had a, if, I, if I was gambling on something and it went up 330 days, and down 35 days a year, psh, all chips to the middle. But the only way it's going to work is if she's got the same commitment. Now, what does that give you when you go ahead and you put each other first and you can look at each other and say, you know the problem in our marriage is not your self-centeredness, but it's my self-centeredness because you can only find another self-centered person to get married to. That's all that exists in our planet, self-centered people. But when we realize that it's my self-centeredness that's worse and we're both submitting to Christ, do you have a raging fire of sexual passion going on all the time? No, what you have is a fireplace that never goes out of character and commitment. And you can do a lot of great things by the fireplace. Some of them romantic. You can cook oatmeal. You can do lots of things by the fireplace. So adult singles, let me describe for you the person you're looking for. Paul wrote about him. He said this, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. That's what you're looking for. You're looking for someone who's not acting out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. But in humility considers others better than themselves. You definitely want that. You admire that. Now that may not be the most popular or the most attractive or the most wealthy person on your quote-unquote hit list. But that's what you want. Each of you should look not only to your own interests but also the interests of others. It's exactly what you're after. But how do we do that? How do we become the person that the person we're looking for is looking for? Because I don't see a lot of pushback today. I don't see a lot of arms folded going, no, I don't want to be patient and kind. That's stupid. 
No, no, I, envy is fun. Envy is awesome. I don't, see, I don't see any of that. But what I can see is, yeah, I'd like to be more patient and kind. I'd like to be less envious, but am I just supposed to try harder? And it's a fair question. And it's not setting you up for failure. The answer is very simple. You chase Jesus. You chase Jesus, and you chase Jesus. Paul mentions it in the next verse. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, he thought he was pretty awesome, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing. You chase Jesus. If you chase Jesus, and not the Jesus you want him to be, but the Jesus who he really is, if you chase Jesus, you'll become more like Jesus. And when you become more like Jesus, you will be coming the person the person you're looking for is looking for. If somebody wants to chase you, they should have to chase Jesus just to start to catch up to you. And if they don't have to chase Jesus to find you, you're on the wrong level. You need to level up. And you can level up. Because you can make that decision. You cannot guarantee who's coming into your life, but you can absolutely control what you are becoming. And it's going to take you not getting on a social media account and getting a new profile photo looking really buff and then having someone photoshop it to make you look even buffer and for some of you putting more hair on your head and all that kind of stuff it's not about that it's about getting more on your face and on your knees and and maybe wiping some butts in the nursery and serving and being kind and growing in those areas and sacrificing and it may not put you uh in a fancy spot it just puts you in a spot where you're standing over here like Jill. And you can go, no, thank you. That's not what I'm looking for. And that's where you want to be. Not because you want to tell somebody no, but because you're looking for someone who's ahead of you. That's what you're looking for. Stand with me, would you? And thanks for your patience.